The American Brain Tumor Association is pleased to welcome you back to our webinar series. As I mentioned, our webinar today will discuss multidisciplinary approaches for treating pediatric tumors. My name is Jennifer Westland. I'm the Associate Director of National Programs and Services here at the American Brain Tumor Association. And I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Mark Kieran. Dr. Kieran is the Clinical Director of Neuro-Oncology at Dana-Farber Children's Hospital Cancer Center in Boston. He received his Ph.D. in 1983 from University of Alberta, Edmonton, Canada, and his M.D. in 1986 from the University of Calgary. He completed postgraduate training in molecular biology at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. And after a pediatric residency in Montreal, Dr. Kieran received postdoctoral education at Children's Hospital Boston. In 1999, he became director of pediatric medical neuro-oncology at DFCI. And he also works on angiogenesis in the laboratory of the late Dr. Judah Folkman. Thank you so very much for joining us today, Dr. Kieran. You may now go ahead and begin your presentation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I hope everybody can hear. Uh, this is the first time I've done this, so this uh, hopefully will be a learning experience for both of us. Uh, as you heard, I'm going to talk about this concept of multidisciplinary approaches for treating brain tumors uh, in pediatrics. And in fact, we're going to talk about uh, how a lot of this has evolved. That just before we uh, begin, um, let's see, I guess I have to figure out how to turn the slides forward. Go down here, maybe. So um, I don't, I'm not paid by any drug companies, I don't own any stock, I don't get any royalties or anything like that, but I do have a number of agreements with drug companies that, that in the, the goal of testing new agents, and so I just wanted to make uh, people aware that in that sense, although I don't get paid or earn any money from them, we do have important collaborations that are going to get some of the drugs that we're going to talk about today actually into uh, the clinic. That, um, so the goal today is really going to be to understand this concept of how to move from uh, the old histopathology, the way things looked under the microscope, to this new concept of the biology of what actually makes tumors tick, in the sense that if we could understand that, we could actually make some real progress. As you're going to see, this requires an enormous investment, just not just in, in the biology itself, but in understanding how to image the tumors, um, the neurosurgical techniques that get the pieces we need, as well as how to do them. And out of all of these things together, as you see uh, as we progress in this uh, webinar, is going to be this concept of personalized medicine. Look at each individual child's tumor based on the abnormalities of that individual tumor, and then base the therapy on that, not on an average of what many kids with that kind of tumor would necessarily have. That's going to really be, to some extent, the goal today. And at the end, we're really going to go over a number of examples. Um, uh, this is probably a good time to remind people, though, that many of the concepts we're going to discuss uh, are relatively general. Obviously, almost each of the slides in this uh, talk could actually become a one-hour talk on their own, and we're not going to have the time to go through that kind of detail. So I'm going to be forced to go over things relatively quickly. Uh, the other thing is the goal at the end of this one hour is not to make you all physicians. Uh, obviously, that you know that's 15 years of training, and so some of the things I'm going to gloss over, and there's always an opportunity to ask questions at the end. The other thing I recognize, I think we all recognize, is that each of you is here because your child has a particular tumor type, which means you're focused on only a particular element of the talk. Again, I'm going to talk both in generalities but give some specifics, but I won't be able to touch every a component of every disease in every circumstance. And in that sense, uh, again, time to ask questions at the end uh, if we have time. The other thing that as you see when we start talking about the biology is that two kids the same age with exactly the same tumor in exactly the same location may have completely different sets of mutation that are causing the tumor and therefore will have completely different types of therapy to treat the tumor and may have completely different outcomes. And so to some extent, it's not going to be whether you've got a high-grade glioma, a medulloblastoma, a low-grade glioma. For the first time, we're going to have to talk about individual tumors and what that means in terms of how they behave. So you're not going to be able to take as many generalizations out of this talk as you would if we were just talking about disease in general. 
And then finally, we uh, in the field have recognized, and I think it's something parents would agree with, it's not just about survival. As a parent myself, we're obviously concerned not just about whether our child survives, but can they finish school, can they go to university, can they get a job, can they have relationships, can they have kids? And those are the things that really de define who we are and what we want for our children. And so when we think about whether a treatment can cure you, if it can cure your child, but with such severe toxicity that in many ways they're devastated for the rest of their lives, that's not the same quality cure as someone that can do the things we just talked about. And so a lot of the new biologic therapy is going to be based on this concept of let's get away from all the toxic radiation and chemotherapy and let's begin to address what makes a tumor tick on the assumption that if you treat that specific problem, you can do so much more effectively and with a lot less toxicity. Now, uh, we're going to start just by giving a couple of examples of, uh, in the radiology and surgical fields. So what you have in front of you is an example of an MRI scan. Obviously, many of you have probably seen MRI scans with your physicians. And this image here is a classic image of an individual that has a brain tumor. Uh, this is a classic MRI scan. And there's a large tumor in the middle here of what's called the left thal uh, thalamic region. And this is not completely resectable. If a surgeon went in and took this out, they would neurologically devastate the child. In addition to doing during this MRI scan, we can also get other pieces of information. So adjacent to this is the diffusion scan. It tells us how the cells are fitting together. Areas that are more black tend to be areas that have more solid tumor in them, as you can see in some of the areas here. And the perfusion scan tells us the way the blood vessels are flowing. And some of the more white stuff, again, gives an idea of where there are areas where the blood is feeding tumors to allow them to grow. And then you see that I've numbered the area, different areas of this tumor into 1, 2, 3, and 4. So if a surgeon went in and biopsied area number 3, for example, they would get mostly just dead necrotic tissue which means three days after the operation, the surgeon would come back into the room and say, actually, I have to go back in and biopsy again. We didn't get anything useful. You can see that area number two is made up of some tumor as well as some necrosis. Area number three, uh, four is made up of some normal brain and some tumor. Whether there would be enough tumor mixed into the normal brain to make a diagnosis is variable. But if the surgeon goes in and just biopsies area number one, it's virtually pure tumor. This is the area that's going to answer the questions. And if we are going to move forward with this concept of personalized medicine, getting the right piece of tissue on which to make the decisions, you can see that this is, this is information that's quite helpful. And this is something that we do, and many centers now do routinely, for every patient that comes in, we do all of these analyses. In addition, we can add on to this kind of more molecular-based imaging. This is an example of what's called a radioactive glucose PET scan, PET. And so here's that MRI scan that I showed you before with a tumor that's sitting right here. Here's a PET scan that can show you two hot areas, kind of active areas of the tumor. Here are the two fused together. So if a surgeon went in and biopsied the tumor over here, they might get something that doesn't look particularly bad. Again, by guiding the biopsy into one of these two areas, you're at least sure that you're getting the worst part of the tumor and can therefore make the appropriate treatment decisions. And in fact, this is a new kind of scan that we're now using here called FLT-PET. So here's the MRI. It, for many of you that haven't looked at a lot of MRI scans, it might actually be hard to even know that there's a tumor here. Here's the radioactive glucose PET scan. And again, if anything, it looks less active than the other side of the brain. But when you do these new types of scans, you can now pick up exactly where the tumor is and therefore know exactly where to biopsy this. And this that now allows really us, the, the radiologist, long before a surgeon has even gone in to do the operation, to have a good idea of where we need to be and what we need to do. Now, if we kind of take that, OK, can we relay that information to the neurosurgeons? And fortunately, the answer is yes. So this is an example of an operating room built inside an MRI scanner. And you can actually see the fingers of the surgeons while he's operating. You can envision that by the time this surgeon is done, there's no question about whether they got the right piece or they left something behind or they were in the wrong area. They know exactly where they are at every second and therefore can guide the the biopsies or the receptions 
based on the imaging that we had talked about before and while they're actually doing the operation. In fact, this is another example of the same thing in a different facility. <clears throat> you can in fact see that the skull at the bottom here is open. So this is a patient that's actually still on the operating room. That This is uh, uh, an MRI scan. Over it, so in green is the area of tumor. And obviously you would say, well, you know exactly where to take it out. The problem is that you'll notice this blue stuff is the spinal fluid, but this aqua, this light-colored stuff, is actually some of the functional capacities of the patient. So this is a patient that's actually awake during this operation. It sounds gross, but it's actually not nearly as bad as it sounds. And we can actually tell them, okay, move your right leg, move your left arm, answer the following math problem. We can see what part of the brain they're using. And in this patient, you can see that in addition to some areas up here, there are some areas near the back of the tumor that you absolutely want to avoid. The other thing is you see all of these white things going up. These are the major bundles of fibers that actually send all of the signals. These are kind of like the cords in the back of your computer that actually connect everything. And that means that if you cut out this tumor, you have to cut out all of these yellow cables, this patient would be devastated. So if you look at a scan like this in the operating room, the surgeon now knows he can only take a biopsy and only from this area here. But by doing so, avoid the blood vessels, avoid the critical thinking areas, avoid the connectivity, and therefore have a patient that is absolutely pristine by the time they come out of the operating room, but with all of the information that's going to be necessary to move forward. Now obviously we've had the radiologist working with the surgeons to kind of put all of this together. Then it's a question of sending stuff to the pathologist. This uh, top panel is an example of kind of classic histology, the stuff that we've been doing for the last hundred years where you just look at how things are all connected. Each one of these little black things is a cell. This is in fact, a, now we can actually analyze things on a single cell basis so that we can begin to understand how all of the cells come together. And this is an example not of all, you don't see the individual cells here. What this uh, stain shows you is how much oxygen each of the cells have. Oxygen is a critically important component of therapy because radiation therapy actually works by uh, hitting a molecule of oxygen next to a cell and that creates what's called an oxygen radical. That's what actually kills a tumor cell. If you don't have any oxygen around tumor cells, tumor cells aren't killed by radiation and that often explains why tumors come back after the radiation. Well, this is a, a, an image that basically shows you the parts of the tumor out here that are full of oxygen, particularly around all the blood vessels. That's not surprising, they're delivering the oxygen. But you can see there are parts of the tumor in here that aren't getting very much, which means when you radiate this, this outer stuff is all going to die, but the tumors, the cells here, because there was no oxygen, are going to survive. That's the tumor that's going to come back. And knowing that means that you may want to change the way you're going to give therapy, either by getting more oxygen into this area first or not relying just on radiation therapy. We've taken molecular analysis one step further, and you're going to see a lot of these in our presentation today because they've become a large part of the molecular characterization of pediatric brain tumors. This is an important study. It was the very first of its type in children with brain tumors done here at the Boston Children's Hospital, um, looking at the molecular profile of patients' uh, children. So each line, each uh, column going down is an individual child. So there are about 10 children across here, another 10 here, and so forth. Each row is a gene and there are about 30 or 40,000 genes in the body that tell things how to function. Some of them are more important than others. Just like in your car, you know, the gas pedal is pretty important in terms of going uh, not fast enough or too fast. Um, if you break your antenna, it's not such a big deal, but if your gas pedal gets stuck to the floor, you can be in big trouble. And this gives us an idea of what some of the important things are. And this is medullal blastoma versus malignant gliomas versus atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors versus normal cerebellum versus tumors called PNETs of the brain. And you can see that they each have completely different sets of genes that are either up or down that tell us that they're functioning in different 
capacities. But in fact, if you just took these medullal blastomas and said, did the same thing, notice how different the medullal blastoma of patient 1 is to the medullal blastoma of patient 2. Even these two patients may not deserve the same therapy as we understand those, those nuances. For example, patient 1 has the second gene super hot and the first gene pretty cold whereas patient number two has not very hot for gene number two, but very hot in number one, they're almost the opposite. And this is where we have to understand the individuality of not just groups of tumors, but even individual tumors. Now, just before we finish on this, because there have been so many advances in radiation therapy, and it's a critical part of therapy, I thought I would just mention this. Radiation therapy is no longer just shining a radiation beam at the head and hitting everything that's uh, between your ears. It's become much more sophisticated, much like uh, on a stage when you're trying to illuminate the actor in the middle of a scene. If you shine those uh, spotlights at all different angles so that they all converge into the middle, you can light up that person in the middle even though the rest of the stage stays dark. Well, we can do the same thing with radiation so that we can hit the, the tumor with all of the radiation while there are only very tiny doses in each of the areas out along the side here so that we spare some of the damage that will be done. The other big advance in radiation oncology has been proton therapy. Proton therapy, which is a, a new type of machine, there are only five or six of them in the United States, is different than photon therapy, which is what 99.9% .9 of programs use. They're equally effective if you had a spinal tumor, so this is a cross-section of the abdomen. If you were treating a spinal tumor, they both give the same dose to the tumor in the middle of the spinal canal, but because photons have to pass through stuff, they also end up accidentally hitting the heart, the liver, the lung, the kidneys, areas for which there, isn't, there is no evidence of tumor in a patient like this, whereas photons can actually stop the movement of the beam so that those tissues in here don't get any of that. And you can envision, it means that photo, uh, protons are not more curative, you get exactly the same dose, but you do less damage to things that aren't involved with the tumor and therefore it gives you better quality of life afterwards. And so if you take all of these advances together, the radiology, the surgery, the pathology, and the uh, radiation oncology, they, now, they give us an enormous amount of information about where your tumor is, what the heterogeneity within it is, we can determine the molecular phenotype, we can do operations that dramatically spare toxicity and radiation, hit only the parts of the tumor that we want. The problem is that all of these advances have really been designed for one major progress, and that is that they reduce the toxicity of the survivors. They don't increase the survivorship. If back in the old days we used to remove half of a child's brain in order to get the tumor out, removing only a tiny piece of the tumor or just around the tumor is not going to be more curative than removing half the brain. But if you survive, not having removed all of that excess normal brain makes you perform much better. Remember how we said survivorship was an important component here. Similarly, back in the old days, they would just radiate the entire brain well now, if you only radiate just the area of the tumor, it isn't going to make you more cured. But by not irradiating the normal areas of the brain means that if you survive, your quality of survivorship goes way up. And obviously the key for the rest of today's discussion is going to be, okay, we need to continue advance on improved neurosurgical techniques, radiation therapy techniques, and so forth, so that the quality of survivorship is better. But how do we actually improve the overall treatment? And in order to do that, we have to better understand what actually makes a tumor tick so that we can actually go after that particular abnormality and in doing so hopefully cause a lot less collateral damage and a much higher cure rate. And that's really what we're going to talk about for the rest of uh, today. Now, a lot of where we've come from over the last, admittedly, 500 years with the development and the discovery of the microscope is Microscopes are basically the ability to look at a, at a section of tissue, much like looking at the uh, covers of books in a library. And if your parents were anything like my parents, they told me not to judge a book by its cover. And yet when we look at a cell, the outside of a cell, we somehow believe that that tells us how to treat the inside where the problems are. And obviously, we haven't been particularly effective in doing that because it turns out the outside cover doesn't often predict what's on the inside. 
the, what I have here is an example of a set, set of experiments that were done by the group in Montreal, uh, not at Jabato's lab, where she took a whole bunch of adult glioblastoma multiforme, a highly malignant tumor. Uh, they're relatively, they're quite common in adults. And she did the molecular profile, so things that are either upregulated or downregulated. And you can see that there's a certain pattern to these adult uh, GBMs. She then took a whole bunch of pediatric GBMs and did exactly the same analysis. So all of these tumors are exactly the same when you look at them under the microscope. All of them are classic GBM. In fact, one of the big problems over the last 30 years is all pediatric GBMs have been treated as if they are adult GBMs because we just assume that since they look the same, they must be the same. But what this group demonstrated is that, for example, this group of pediatric GBMs don't have any of the abnormalities here that the adult ones do, and that even pediatric tumors that do have those same abnormalities then have a completely different set of abnormalities that both other pediatric tumors don't have nor the adults have, i.e., pediatric tumors are not just different from adults, many pediatric tumors, GBMs for example, are even different from each other, which means there isn't even going to be one treatment just for kids with this tumor, let alone using the treatment of adults, that already means we're barking up the wrong direction. And this concept of looking at differences not from a microscopic point of view, but from a molecular point of view, is what's going to lead us to the next step. Now we in fact in Boston are already doing this. When a child goes to the operating room with a spot that's seen on an MRI scan with all of the things we've talked about, the radiology, the surgery, and the surgeon takes some of it out and we analyze it in the ways under the microscope, but we also take some of the DNA, the RNA, and the proteins, the building blocks of all cells, and the things where the mutations are going to have occurred, and many mutations are in DNA, some mutations are in RNA, and some mutations are in protein, so you have to analyze all three of them. We can then do all of those molecular analyses that we've been talking about, figure out exactly what's wrong with this individual tumor, and then begin to ask questions. And again, everything I'm going to show you today is not things that are theoretically things that we might one day be doing in kids. Every single thing I've showed you so far and will continue to show you is already being done in kids with brain tumors. Now, as we've uh, switched from this kind of microscopic appearance to cells to this concept of understanding the biology, brings in these things called pathways. And uh, it's, again, we're not going to make you pathway experts in a one short hour talk, but the basic concepts here that are repeated a hundred thousand times over in uh, patients, both adult and pediatrics, is you have things on the outside of the cells like growth factors and ligands, basically that, that say how much food is in the neighborhood, that kind of stuff. There are these receptors that link to the inside of the cell. This is the cell membrane. And then there are pathways. One of them is the PI3 uh, kinase pathway demonstrated here. You can see me moving up and down. Another is called the RAS-RAF pathway. And these are basically the signals that when something happens out here, there's a little change on the inside here that sends a pathway down one of these and tells the cell, oh, we've been given the signal to divide or to migrate or to invade. The problem is that what tumors do is they trick these things. They break them in such a way that the, the the on signal is stuck in the on position so that even when there's nothing on the outside telling you to do anything, the cell is tricked into thinking that you're supposed to be dividing. And because of that, it keeps sending the, set, the signal to divide, and that's why you keep making more and more and more tumor cells, which means if you can find the thing that turns off that signal, you may be able to stop those cells without hurting any of the normal cells around them. Okay, now this is another complicated picture of exactly the same thing I just showed you. So here's the receptor, here's the little thing that would normally bind and tell it to send a signal because it's time to divide or something. The problem is that with mutations, these things start happening on their own. Now the mutation can be up here so that this gets stuck in the on position, whether this molecule is around or not. This is kind of like a key and a lock and this is supposed to fit into the hole here, and that's what turns it on, but sometimes this can stay on even when that's not present. And all of the, in all of these boxes here, at each of the different levels, you can see all the way over here, 
these are all molecules that have been invented by drug companies that actually turn these specific things off. So if you have a mutation in PI3 kinase, you can use a drug like XL765 to turn it off. If your child's mutation is in something over here called BRAF, using a drug over here isn't going to help because it's on the wrong pathway. So you can begin to see how important it is to know for your child's individual tumor exactly where is the abnormality because then that tells us exactly which drug to use. In a somewhat more simplistic way, here's another way to think about it. You have three patients that all look like they have exactly the same brain tumor that, under the microscope, but this patient's tumor is driven by mutation A. They need drug A. Drug B wouldn't work. Whereas in this patient, drug A wouldn't work, only drug B will work. Now, of course, these two examples are kind of simplified because they don't represent what really happens. In fact, what most tumors do is they don't just mutate one thing. They'll often mutate a whole bunch to kind of keep themselves going. The analogy of getting the gas pedal stuck to the floor is something they like to do. But unfortunately, the cars in our brain, we actually have 10 different gas pedals, and they often try to make sure that at least three or four of them are stuck at the same time, which means if you just treated with drug A, the gas pedals for B and C would keep the cells growing. Same for B or C. It's only when you use the combination of all three of them that you would actually get the, the, the tumor to disappear. Um, so if we kind of say, OK, where are we? Um, you can understand we now have the ability to look at things at their molecular, not just their histologic levels, and that's allowed us to uh, a fundamental shift in the understanding of how we're going to potentially treat tumors. We have all of these drugs available that because of their specificity should be less toxic and more active. So now what we need to do is actually put this into action. So this is just an example of some of the different approaches that are being taken to how to treat patients. So for example, there are all kinds of novel drugs, novel chemotherapy, novel anti-angiogenic, anti-blood vessel, some of the agents that I just showed you, gene therapy, immunotherapy. But remember, because the brain is in a sequestered location, sometimes if you have a drug that could kill a tumor, but it can't get into your brain to kill it, it's not going to be effective. And so we have all kinds of approaches to actually get the treatment into your brain to make sure that it can be active. Because only an active drug in the active place is actually going to produce the results we want. Now, all of these have been tested in kids, whether it be directly into the spinal fluid, wafers, reservoirs, uh, tumoral infusion, or this, this new area called convection enhanced delivery. And what I was going to do is just give you one example of how we're altering the way we get stuff into uh, tumors. So convection enhanced delivery is this concept of bypassing the blood-brain barrier by actually putting catheters right into the brain so there's no question about how stuff gets in. So when a surgeon cuts out your tumor, obviously the stuff they've cut out is the stuff that's never going to hurt your child uh, again. It's sitting in a pathology some, somewhere, sitting in, in formaldehyde. It's the little fibers that come off of the tumor that the surgeon can't see. And obviously you didn't want a surgeon to take a big, huge swath of normal brain to try and get these out because he can't even see them. So this is a place where we start using this new technology. So what you could do, for example, is put a catheter into this, not into here, because then the, the liquid would just sit there like, like water in a pothole, but rather into the leading edges and then under pressure, that's what this shows, you can start to force the drug through and around all of the cells. It will obviously find the ones that have the mutations and kill them and not affect the normal cells at all. And this is a process called convection enhanced delivery. Now the next slide I'm going to show you actually has um, a picture of somebody's skull open with these in it. So for those of you that don't want to see it, just turn away from your screen for a minute and then I'll tell you when to turn back. Okay, so this is a patient that's actually, the tumor's already been taken out here. And again, if you just sat something in there, it would just kind of pool there like, like water in a pothole. Rather, here's where we've embedded the, the leads to go into the leading edge of the tumor, the part the surgeon can't see and take out. And then we close up the skull 
And then what we do is through these little ports here, we start infusing the drugs to find those tumor cells and kill them, knowing that for sure the drug is going to get in, they're already within the brain. Now this isn't a perfect technology. In fact, here in Boston, we did the first two kids ever right here. The problem right now, for example, is that when you start squirting the stuff in, it often starts leaking back up along the tube and leaks out here. So we haven't solved all of the mechanical issues yet, but you can see that this technique whether it's a, a, a new chemotherapeutic drug, a biologic drug, a gene therapy, an immunotherapy, this is going to be ideal no, what, no matter what kind of therapy you've got, and therefore it's something that we're quite excited about going forward in the future. Now the other thing that we've already talked a lot about, but I didn't give a name to, is this concept called small molecule inhibitors. So a small molecule, remember I showed you those those stylized receptors before that are in the cell membrane and they kind of connect the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell and when the this little thing here called a ligand binds the receptor it causes a little uh, change on the inside that sends the signal to divide and what drug companies have been doing is making these very tiny molecules hence the word small molecules that move into the cell and actually bind these little areas so when something up here happens this can no longer send the signal they basically interfere and in fact here's that slide that I showed you before each one of these things here is a small molecule inhibitor that fits either into the little thing here to stop the signal from going or fits into the little thing here to stop the signal or here to stop the signal or here to stop the signal and in each step you can choose exactly the small molecule you want to hit exactly the thing you want or downstream to turn stuff off. And the things that are in green here, the PI3 kinase, the BRAF, Sonic Hedgehog, I'm actually going to show you those three examples in a moment. Okay, so these are the four that I thought I would show you. Obviously I can't show you every example, there just isn't enough time, but these are four that hopefully give you some uh, different ideas. So the first is, is a pathway called Sonic Hedgehog in medulloblastoma. We're going to talk about the molecular profiling in diffuse intrinsic pontinglioma. We're going to talk about BRAF inhibitors in pediatric low-grade gliomas, and we're going to talk about immunotherapy for high-grade gliomas and ependymomas. All of these trials are underway, and I'm going to show you how they work. So remember at the very beginning I had showed you that blue pinkogram thing of the different tumor types, the very first one that was done for kids with brain tumors, and I showed you up in the corner just the medulloblastoma ones. So in this profile, so this is a couple of hundred kids all with medulloblastoma, and now when you repeat that analysis that I showed you before, but with hundreds of samples, you can see that medulloblastoma isn't a single disease. Here's one type of medulloblastoma, and you can even guess that maybe this site is a little bit different than this side. Here's a second type of medulloblastoma, and again, this one looks even a little different from this one, whether those should be two separate categories or one, we could discuss. Here's a third type. This is called Wnt type medulloblastoma. And this one here is called sonic uh, uh, hedgehog medulloblastoma. And I'm going to give some examples of clinical trials that we're doing here. But we also have clinical trials for this one now and for this one. Don't have any yet for this one. But you can see that treating patients with this therapy that have this, this, or this type of medulloblastoma isn't going to work can't really think of medulloblastoma as a single disease anymore. So this is a kind of weird picture, and I'll explain what it is. Um, so um, as often happens, there was a fortuitous discovery from pregnant lambs that were feeding on these wildflowers in the hills of California and Colorado with a plant called Veraticum californicum. And it just so happens that if the, the ewe was pregnant at the time that she was eating these plants, she would be born, she would give an offspring of a baby that when it was born was cycloped, it had only one eye, and it had no formation of the brain. The brain never ended up forming. And it turns out that we discovered that the reason this is true is that early in development, your brain has, your brain cells have to divide like crazy. That's how you get all of your brain cells. So although when we think about cancers as dividing cells as being a bad thing, Remember that at one point in your development, dividing brain cells was in fact a very good thing. Now, uh, perhaps one of the most uh, disappointing parts of the entire presentation today is the knowledge that actually at the time of about one month after birth, 
you have all of the brain cells you're basically ever going to have. So you're kind of smartest at about one month of age. What makes us smart as we get older is not making new brain cells. You don't do that. The, the dividing of brain cells is done. It's the connections between the cells you've already got. So the problem in this lamb is that because this drug was present during the formation of the brain, none of the cells could divide to actually make the brain. But of course, for kids with medulloblastoma, after one month of age, they've already got their brain fully formed. And so there is no more normal brain proliferation. But it turns out that the tumor cells are dividing. And what they have done is trick the body, some of the cells in the brain, to think that they're embryos again and that they should be dividing. It's one of the kind of bad things that tumor cells do in tricking it so that the body doesn't try to stop it. It simply tells it to do something it was supposed to do, but not anymore. Well, of course, now we can take that same drug that turns off the division abnormally if you're a fetus, can now turn it off when it shouldn't be happening without hurting any of the normal cells. This is an example of a molecularly targeted approach to a specific abnormality that will allow us to treat these tumors. And there are a whole bunch of drug companies tripping over each other to try and figure out who can make the best of these drugs. And we're not going to focus on any one person's drug over anybody else's. They all have pros and cons. This is part of the clinical trial that I've been running both in North America and Europe. Here are two kids that had had radiation, chemotherapy, transplants, and whose medulloblastoma kept coming back. We tested them and they were positive for the sonic hedgehog type, not those other types. We treated them with a sonic hedgehog inhibitor and lo and behold the tumors disappeared. Exactly what we would have predicted for the sonic hedgehog type. We also treated some patients that had the non-sonic hedgehog medulloblastoma with this same drug, and not surprisingly, it didn't work at all. If you don't have the sonic hedgehog as the mutation, a sonic hedgehog drug isn't going to work. Okay? So the second example I'm going to give you is about uh, molecular profiling for diffuse pontinglioma. This is, in pediatrics, probably the worst of the worst. These are highly malignant tumors in the pons of the brain that uh, do a lot of damage because they kind of infiltrate everywhere. And the, the kind of dogma for the last 30 years is you should never biopsy because if you biopsy this part of the brain, you could damage some of the critical stuff in here. And so we don't biopsy them. And because we don't biopsy them, we don't even know what these are. So for the last 30 years, we've been treating them as adult glioblastoma multiforme. And 30 years ago, the survival rate for kids with the diffuse intrinsic pontinglioma, virtually all of the kids have died by two years. And over the last 30 years, we've now done about 250 trials treating these just like adult glioblastoma multiforme with all kinds of different drugs. And after a 250 trial, thousands and thousands of patients in 30 years the cure rate is still virtually zero, and virtually everyone is still dead by two years. We've made no progress. And so uh, some years back, with all of the developments that I showed you in surgery and imaging, we asked the question, could you start to biopsy these tumors? Well, the French beat us to it. They did the first ones, and so we started working with the French, and we actually took some of these newly diagnosed tumors, and we analyzed them for some of those signals, some of those potential mutations, and here we found about a third of the, a quarter of the kids have a mutation in the PI3 kinase pathway, and the reason that's so important is, as I showed you, we already have a drug that turns off that mutation. And in fact, the drug company that makes that drug has already approved a clinical trial specifically for kids with pontinglioma that have that mutation. This is kind of like you know, medicine in action. We're actually reacting to the things that we're discovering. Now again, we still need to continue to biopsy to learn more, a lot more about these tumors, and we've been doing that now. So we now routinely biopsy, and this is a protocol that we're running here in Boston, and 20 other sites around the United States have joined in with us. We're using all of this very sophisticated imaging. We can go in and just biopsy just the part of the tumor we want. You can kind of see it in all of this coordinated stuff here. And with that, then determine what your treatment should be. So all of the kids in this trial have exactly the same tumor, diffuse intrinsic pontinglioma, but they're not all getting the same treatment. Their treatment is based on exactly what the 
molecular examination of their tumor is. So two parents talking to each other on the same clinical trial for the same disease are actually having their kids treated differently. And this concept of personalizing the approach to your child's tumor while understanding what the mutations are, are the progress that we've been able to make. So the second to last example I'm going to give is this low-grade glioma. So low-grade gliomas are the most common tumor of pediatrics. They account for about 40% of all of the brain tumors that we see in kids. And they come by a whole bunch of different names and stuff that we're not going to go into. Um, if you look at them under the microscope, so this is a child with a posterior fossa pilocytic astrocytoma. This is a child with an optic pathway low-grade glioma. Under the microscope, they would appear exactly the same, but we now know that the molecular profiles tend to differ. So we did a molecular analysis of 250 kids with low-grade gliomas and kind of said, okay, what are some of the abnormalities? So here are a whole bunch of them, and you can see that some of the things are way down and others are way up, cold and hot. But what's interesting, we looked at adults with exactly the same tumors, and you can see that they're the opposite. In this group of adults, this is up while this is down in kids, and vice versa. This is mostly down, whereas this is up in kids. Even though the, the histology people would have told you those are exactly the same tumor. But what was most interesting, and gets to, again, some of the points we talked about, here are a group of kids that actually look a lot like... Um, you know, that, that are different even from these. So you can see that in here, this part's up and this part's down, so it's neither this nor this. It means that even in pediatrics, low-grade gliomas, again, are not a single disease. It turns out they're turning out to be a whole bunch of different diseases. And the, the drugs that you would use to treat this group of kids, remember, each one of these lines, there are 250 uh, columns here, I mean, each one of these uh, kids here, um, is going to need a different treatment than these kids over here. And same here and here and et cetera, et cetera. So this is another, this is one of those simplified pathway. So remember I told you about here's the RAS, RAF, MEC pathway, and here's the PI3 kinase pathway that I was telling you about. Well, we know when you look at kids with low-grade glioma, many of them have a genetic disease called neurofibromatosis. And if that's the cause of their disease, we know that's because there's a mutation here. We also know that there's a disease called tubular sclerosis in which you get low-grade gliomas as well, and that's because of a mutation here. If your child doesn't have this mutation because they don't have this genetic disease and they don't have neurofibromatosis in this mutation, we and others were able to discover that almost all of the kids that don't have these two diseases get low-grade gliomas because they have one of two mutations in this gene called BRAF. And that's important because we have drugs that can target each of these individual things, particularly these now that I'm going to show you. And in fact, as I already showed you, we have one of these, and we're just about to start a clinical trial with one of these as well. So here, for example, is the patient with tubular sclerosis. The mutation is in the gene here, and we have a drug that attacks the thing that it signals to. There isn't a drug right now that effectively attacks here, so we use the one just downstream. So here's a patient that has two tumors. You can see one here, one here. There are actually a couple more here, and there's another one there. We started them on the drug, and the tumor started to shrink. The patient decided to stop their drug. The tumors got bigger again. We restarted the drug. The tumor started to shrink, almost like a yo-yo. We can control how big your, or small your tumor is by how long you're on the drug. We now also have tests for the BRAF gene so that we can test any child's tumor just using the stuff that's been sitting in, para, in uh, uh, formaldehyde, and we can determine whether they've got either what's called the truncated fusion or the mutation, and that's important because the treatments for them require two different drugs. The drug for one won't work on the other and vice versa, and so we're already running that clinical trial. So here again, we can analyze each individual child and move forward. And then the last example I'm going to give you is this immunotherapy or gene therapy. So the classic concept here is when you give radiation therapy, you damage the DNA of a tumor cell so that it starts to break, and that's supposed to lead to cell death. Unfortunately, tumor cells figured this part out way long ago, and what they do is they just repair the damage, and they don't end up dying at all. And that's why the vast majority of tumors are not cured by radiation therapy. The real thing is just how much time you get before the radiation can all be repaired and the tumors start growing again. So in conjunction with a number of companies, we started these pro 
protocols to see whether or not it's possible to wake your immune system up to recognize a tumor cell. And this is using something that's injected directly into the tumor that allows, uh, that alters something about the DNA that leads to cell death and turns on the immune system so even those cells that didn't see any of the gene therapy can now be attacked by the immune system. So here's an example of if you treat a tumor with this, you can start to cause dramatic shrinkage in the tumor with this therapy that if you use non-specific therapies don't work at all. What was interesting is you can also start to get shrinkage in parts of the tumor that you didn't even treat because once you wake up the immune system, it starts going to other parts of the brain and attacking the same tumor cells. And that's great for people that don't have completely resectable tumors because you can use your immune system to go get them. So if you use a therapy that doesn't work, all of the, this is an example of animals injected with these tumors, they all die. Whereas with this therapy, you can actually cure a number of those animals. And in fact, even in adults, with terminal end-stage glioblastoma, we were actually able to make this slow down their tumor growth. Now, obviously, the goal is not to treat everybody at the time they're relapsing and in terminal phase. So the, the trial going on in kids right now is we're actually doing this right at the time of diagnosis so that we don't wait for them to relapse before we waken up the immune system to attack them. Okay? So when we kind of summarize just these, these four examples, Again, enormous advances in defining the molecular signature of a tumor, and that through those we've recognized pediatric tumors are completely different in the vast majority of cases from adults, that the treatments that we use, you know, using these targeted inhibitors can specifically attack individual mutations, but obviously that means that you have to know what mutation you're treating in order to know what drug to choose for which particular child. And then as we think about starting to combine all of these inhibitors together, we're going to be able to make the perfect uh, cocktail for each individual child once we have learned all of these. Now I should point out, remember, not every drug company has yet discovered a drug against every mutation. So there are still some mutations for which they haven't found drugs. So this isn't the perfect situation yet, but it's getting better every day. And even over the last five years, the number of, of pathways that can be targeted have gone up exponentially. So um, obviously, uh, if you want to learn more just in general about the brain tumor program, there's some uh, things for you to uh, connect here, as well as more information. I've put some of those up there. But I thought what we would do now is stop and begin to take some questions, because I've probably raised as many as I've answered. Uh, as I've answered. So thank you for letting me do this part, and uh, I think we'll start with the question part, if that's OK. Dr. Kieran, thank you so very much. That was a, a great presentation. I think your style is really excellent, and hopefully did. Um, answer a lot of questions for folks, but we do have some time now reserved for questions. If you do have a question for Dr. Kieran, as I mentioned earlier, you can go ahead and type it in, and we will um, begin with a question from Susan. And Susan is asking if there is currently a data available for uh, children treated for medulloblastoma around the time that her son was, which was around 1988. Is there any um, corresponding data for that particular time frame? So uh, if the question is it, uh, data in terms of survivability, the, the vast, I, I assume that that's the question, um, the majority of patients that relapse with medulloblastoma will relapse within the first three years of treatment. So after that, the odds that you're going to be cured for the rest of your life is actually pretty high. Obviously, there are some rare late, late relapses, but odds are her child is going to be a long-term survivor. Obviously, our therapies back then were not nearly as sophisticated, so we tended to do more damage back then than we necessarily do now. Um, and those are unfortunately things we can't always take back. The one thing you do have to be careful of is that because a lot of those therapies use radiation therapy, remember that radiation therapy isn't just a good way to treat a tumor, it's a good way to also cause a tumor. And so these are kids that need surveillance all of their lives to make sure that we're not inducing something. But in terms of outcome, um, the kids are, at this point, would certainly be expected to be a long-term survivor, and now it's really dealing with the sequelae of that therapy. Thank you. 
Uh, there's another question from Lana, and she asks, what identifiers determine if a mass is a cyst or a tumor? So it's, um, so a cyst is, is technically defined as a fluid-filled cavity, whereas a mass, um, and it's a little bit semantics, and I'm sure many of you have already been through this, you know, does my child have a tumor or cancer? And um, we typically think of a mass as being something solid, and for the brain, uh, the word mass, tumor, cancer are largely synonymous. Um, remember that the brain doesn't have a lot of free space in it, so even a benign tumor that's not growing can still kill you because if, it, if we can't stop it from growing, it will eventually take up too much space. And that's why, although we refer to them as brain tumors, they're kind of ubiquitous. The other important difference is that when somebody has a lot of fluid in an area, the treatment for fluid, like cysts, is to go in and drain the cyst. Chemotherapy and radiation don't work particularly well on fluid. They're meant to be attacking cells. So if you have a tumor, you typically need radiation, chemotherapy, or biologic therapy. If you have a cyst, you usually need a surgeon to go in and drain the fluid. Thank you. The next question comes from Crystal. She asks, are there hospitals that do request molecular analysis of DIPG at the same time of diagnosis? Well, so there are 20 institutions in the United States that have joined our protocol that are doing this. So, you know, uh, Denver, St. Louis, uh, Dallas, John Hopkins. Uh, so if you go to one of those, but not every institution is taking part. Another question from um, an uh, attendee regarding cysts, and she asks, what is the gold standard treatment for symptomatic pineal cysts? So if it's a true pineal cyst, in fact, if you just dragged 100 people off of the sidewalk and scanned them, you would frequently find uh, a, a, just a non-relevant pineal cyst in a, a you know, a significant proportion of them. We only treat the ones that are symptomatic, and if it's a true cyst, the only thing you would do is the surgeon would go in and suck out some of the fluid. Okay, the next question uh, comes from Jason. He asks, are there any examples in pediatric or adult brain tumors where the therapies mentioned have led to long-term remission? Um, the same about uh, so again, I'm not quite sure if he meant the targeted stuff. Obviously, you know we cure 85 percent of standard risk medullo, 70 percent of high risk medullo. Uh, virtually all low grade gliomas are now cured. It's very rare to have anyone die of that. Uh, so we're already curing a lot of patients, although we're doing it with a fair amount of toxicity. So um, the question of of are we curing patients even with the old therapies? The answer is yes. Um, the problem in terms of the newer therapies is the way we would typically define cure is that you die of old age, which means our therapies have to be kind of 60 or 70 years old in order for our kids to now have died of old age and not their tumor. And unfortunately, we haven't been doing that long enough to answer that question. So. Uh, you know, I have every expectation that many of the therapies we're now doing will result in long-term cures, but you'll only answer that question in the long term. Thank you. The next question comes from Patricia, and she asks, um, with respect to anaplastic astrocytoma recurrence, are there any therapies available for that? Um, so anaplastic um, astrocytoma is, is categorized into the high grader malignant glioma that um, we know that with radiation therapy and some chemotherapy, we can often hold them at bay, but unfortunately we're not effective in the vast majority of cases in the long term. These are tumors that already know how to be resistant to radiation therapy, usually from the day go, and it's the uh, day one. It's really just a matter of how long it takes them to recover from the therapy. That once tumors have progressed after that, you can continue to try and remove as much of them as possible. That will often delay the time to recurrence. You can uh, try more chemotherapy. There are a number of biologic therapies we're testing right now based on the mutational profile of these tumors, and that's what we're doing here, for example, for these tumors. 
we would choose the therapy based on that. Whether we've got enough of the inhibitors, whether we can put them in the right combination. Remember I showed you that some tumors that start out with mutation A, B, and C, and therefore you need the right cocktail in order to be successful. We're still working on figuring those, those, those cocktails, and right now that's still considered experimental. So it's being tried. It's too early to say that it's successful, but we and certainly other sites around the country are doing it. Thank you. The next question comes from Scott. He asks, what is the newest or advanced treatment for an LGG that does not have the BRAF mutation or neuro neurofibrotosis? Um, so actually, uh, just recently, uh, we have discovered two new pathways that are not BRAF. So BRAF okay. mutations occur for not including the patients with neurofibromatosis or tubular sclerosis, because those have unique genetic diseases. If you take the people that don't have the genetic diseases, um, about 85% of them have abnormalities in BRAF, which means 15% don't. We've now found about 5% that have a mutation in a pathway called uh, uh, the uh, growth factor receptor type 1, and that's exciting because, in fact, we're already working with a drug company because they have a drug against that, and we're just now beginning to do those testing. Um, we found a second mutation that accounts for an, another 5% of that 15% in a gene called M MLB1, um, and we're working with a company to try and make a drug against that one, and then for the remaining 5% we haven't discovered. So there are some options if your tumor doesn't have BRAF, um, whether it's going to be one of the two that we've discovered or ends up in the 5% that we haven't discovered, we would only know after testing. Thank you. The next question comes from Lourdes, and she asks, uh, pineoblastomas kids are grouped and treated under medulloblastomas. Is there any data showing mutations for this type of tumor and any survivorship data for recurrences? Yeah. So, um, so pineoblastoma is uh, currently grouped under the rubric of uh, CNSPNET, and if you remember that very first slide I showed you with medulloblastoma way up in the top upper corner, PNET was the one way down in the lower bottom corner, and it was the most variable. Almost every tumor looked differently. Unfortunately, the heterogeneity in these tumors is much greater, and it's therefore been harder to find one single way to treat them. Currently, with the standard high-dose radiation and chemotherapy, um, we can cure about 50% of those kids. Uh, once the kids have recurred after radiation therapy, though, the treatments have not been particularly successful. Um, there are some experimental therapies going on, but again, those are all investigational. I don't want to make it sound like any of them have yet been proved effective. So we don't hold anything back when we're treating these highly malignant upfront tumors like PNETs, like pineoblastoma, like anaplastic astrocytoma, like GBM, like DIBG. We throw all of the best we've got at them up front, um, which means once they've recurred, unfortunately, we don't have as much good stuff left behind. Thank you. The next question comes from Carrie, and she asks, where is the majority of research of understanding tumors at the molecular level taking place? Um, it's, this has really become, you know, the, our discovery, for example, of the PI3 kinase mutation uh, in pontine gliomas was a joint effort between Paris and Boston. The discovery of the IGFR1 mutation in pediatric low-grade gliomas was a joint uh, effort between the Germans, the Canadians, and uh, two groups here in the United States. Um, the discovery of the BRAF mutation was done here in Boston. It's happening everywhere in different components. The key is that if you're at a major center, they'll have something or speak to your neuro-oncologist about what they've got. If they don't, centers like ours will always do the analysis. Well, that's never a problem. Okay. The next question comes from Crystal. She asks, what will we have uh, what will we need to have happen for molecular evaluation of tumors to become mandatory? Um, the problem is that currently uh, molecular analysis is expensive, although uh, like by expensive I mean the cost of one or two MRIs. 
which unfortunately insurance companies are sufficiently blinded about that they think is unjustified cause. We've tried to point out that choosing the right therapy from the beginning in the long run would be infinitely cheaper, but unfortunately many companies don't think about what it might not cost them in the future. They think only about what they're being asked to pay today. So right now, for example, in Boston, we, out of philanthropy, out of the money we raise from fundraising efforts, actually pays for 100% of all of the molecular testing for every patient. The insurance companies are paying zero. And that's the change that's going to have to occur sometime in the future uh, in order for this to be more standard at every institution in the country. Okay, we do have time for one last question, which comes from Erica, and she asks, should MRAs be done with follow-up protocols? So an MRA is a magnetic resonance angiography. It's a part of the MRI scan I didn't show you uh, uh, on some of those first slides, and it tells you about the nature and structure of the blood vessels feeding the tumor that's different from the perfusion imaging that I showed you. Um, there are some advantages and some disadvantages to it, and it really depends on the kind of tumor you've got uh, that determines whether that's going to be of any value or not. So that's unfortunately not a single answer question. The type of therapy you've had, the symptoms you've got, and exactly where and what your tumor was means that the answer is either absolutely yes or no, you don't need it at all. Okay, well thank you all uh, very much for participating. Um, unfortunately, we, we do have to go ahead and, and wrap up for today. Um, there were so many more great questions. We'll see if offline, if we can get to some of those and uh, we'll follow up with you. Um, that is all the time we have today. I'd like to say a very special thank you to Dr. Mark Kieran at Dana-Farber and Children's Hospital Cancer Center in Boston. This was a great presentation. Um, and for those of you who may have signed on late, you may not have heard me announce that we are recording this webinar today. You will, following the program, receive in an email a link to the webinar. It will also be posted to the American Brain Tumor Association website for viewing anytime at your convenience. The website is www.abta.org.